cool. Well, so I guess the first thing maybe is for each of you to introduce yourselves and how you're tied to bystander training. So, uh, Graham, I think I met you first. I'm trying to remember now. <laughs> Where did we meet? I think we we met in London. Is that we was in London, and then I came out to Michigan um, to speak at the roundtable event out there, which is fantastic. But um, yeah, but my, my my name's Graham Golden. Um, I am a retired police officer, too young to retire, as a lot of people say. Um, I spent 30 years as a, a Scottish police officer. Um, in the last 10 years of my policing career, I was a chief inspector working with the Violence Reduction Unit in Scotland. Um, that organisation was set up to look at long-term prevention of violence and abuse in society, in, in, in Scottish society. And I, I started to really look at the role of the bystander. Um, I suppose in my early years in the police service, interviewing witnesses who had witnessed violence and abuse, and they would often say things to me like, I knew something was going to happen. I could tell this wasn't end well, that this wasn't going to end well. And I always used to think to myself, why do these people not step up and do something? Um, and then I got a chance in 2010 to bring a bystander program into, into Scotland, into our high schools, to talk about um, good relationships, but to, to really create a conversation in Scotland around the... Uh, the norms, the culture, which often says violence is okay. Um, so I really became a very passionate advocate of the bystander approach. I think it's like um, the conversation we're going to have today. Hopefully that will come come out in, in in the chat. But it's a great it's a great tool to get people talking. You know, the, we we have a lovely quote in the UK: "We have more in common than which divides us." Mm -hmm. And I find the bystander work allows us to bring the commonality to the surface. And we're seeing that just now, and with the COVID nineteen crisis. We're seeing a lot of common purpose and commonality in society. You know, there's, there's, there appears to be less division. And the bystander approach, I think, really works well in bringing that commonality to the to the surface. So yeah, that, that's the sort of brief introduction. I, you know, I, I now retire from the policing. I do my own my own trainings in workplaces, schools, universities, prisons, sports teams, using the bystander approach to help these clients um, just create culture. And we'll, and we'll talk more about that. But Andrea. Mm. Yeah, sure. I, I'd actually like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the, the land I meet on and where that is as well. Uh, and uh, to all First Nations people around the world, just uh, like to pay my respect to elders past, present and emerging. Um, and also like to acknowledge that uh, all, all of the people who've gone before me in uh, both prevention of violence uh, and the bystander work as well, as well as uh, any victim survivors who might be listening in as well. Uh, so my background, um, I'm actually been in education most of my most of my working life, uh, teacher, psychologist, uh, principal, and more recently uh, in pr primary prevention work with schools. Um, and my work with bystander stuff, I, I got involved with the MATE program uh, here in Australia, and in terms of the MATE program here in Australia, they what I did was Gippsland <coughs> Women's Health. Uh, brought that down to Victoria and I got involved with it through my work um, at that stage. Um, but I've been involved with bystander work prior to that as well when I was looking at uh, peer mediation in schools and building cultures of respect and equality uh, in, in all of the schools that I've ever worked in. And now I work with schools. That's exactly what I do. It's about supporting schools to build cultures of respect and equality uh, and build positive climates for learning. And in doing that, prevention of violence as well. Right on. Um, I think Michael and Greg have joined us. Michael, I don't know you. Maybe you could, do, do you, uh, what was I going to say? Can you, can you let us know what you're interested in and, and what your background is coming into this and we can jump back to Graham and Andrea. Sure. Um, so uh, I'm a research psychologist and I focus on social heroism. And so, um, uh, a lot of my, um, uh, I'm curious about the, um, I wanted to go to the Hero Roundtable in New York um, this weekend. Uh, Me too. Uh, that didn't work out. So uh, I've been curious about the kind of work you do. Obviously, you're, you're more on an applied side. And while I'm a, a researcher, I do, um, I don't really see the point of research unless it actually gets applied. So um, I was uh, very curious to just, um, see uh, uh what what your 
what the round table is like since I couldn't get there physically. Um, and I'm interested in this topic because I think it's very important in terms of um, uh, you have a boyfriend. You know, Wait, that's not that, I think, so. And so are you in New York? Uh, no, actually I'm um, uh, I'm a, so I'm in I'm I'm physically in Italy. Uh, I was physically in New York two weeks ago, um, so I'm doing like the hot spots. Um, yeah. I, uh, <laughs> um, but I work. Um, I'm doing my doctorate in uh, Claremont Graduate University so in California. So. Ah, okay, okay. Yeah. Do you know uh, Brian Riches out there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know Brian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, we're in the same program. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. He, um, mm. yeah, we I've published with him. He's been. He was at the first Hero Roundtable. Um, yeah, very, very involved. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Cool. Uh, Annabelle, where are you coming in from? I'm coming in from Melbourne, Fairfield, Melbourne. And you're here as a, as a fan of Andrea? Totally. <laughs> Completely. And you. And you. <laughs> and all your, your people. Right on. Well, and Greg obviously is here for Andrea as well. It's uh, much appreciated. You, you might want to tell him that he's on camera because I don't think he realises. <laughs> okay. No, I realise. I don't realise. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, I'm using my iPad. Yeah, cover your camera. <laughs> you should be able to turn the camera off easily enough. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, Graham, where did you... So, you've done... I, I know you've done some work in, um, uh, in the US and connected with people there. So, what's that uh, look... What, what has that looked like? I suppose, you know... You know Michael talked about applying a lot of the theory and the research, and that's what I've tried to do. And I started to work with a guy called Jackson Katz, who is who's based in America, and he created the, the Mentors and Violence Prevention Program back in the sort of mid mid nineties in Boston. Um, and I met Jackson first of all in two thousand and nine. Um, he came to Scotland to speak at an event we were arranging around domestic violence, domestic abuse in Scotland, and really within minutes of of meeting this guy, he just had me hooked. You know, he spoke to me as, you know, because the MVP program, the Mentors and Violence program, it's, it's a program initially designed to engage boys and men in the prevention of violence. Um, and what, what the MVP program does is it puts men into the role of the bystander, the friend, the colleague, the teammate. Because when you look at subjects like sexual violence, domestic violence, you know, men are looked at as the problem or the potential problem. And what I liked about his approach was that we... we um, removed that binary focus and we looked at men as a solution and um, a lot of the work that I do now focuses on on male violence you know we, we yeah yeah you know women commit violence there's no doubt about it but when it when we look at violence you know men's violence against men men's violence against women and suicides you know we can't ignore the the risk factors and one thing we do in Scotland is we look at public health conversations around violence and we look at risk a bit like what's happening in the world today it's a public health conversation we're having every night in our living rooms so you know I, I got to work with Jackson was able to bring his program from the states um, I basically put a kilt on it put my kilt on it and, <laughs> and brought it to Scotland um, we, we we adapted it slightly we didn't change it a great deal and um, yeah, it's a program that I introduced 2010 when I retired from policing in 2017. Um, it, you know, our education department were, were running the program um, in our in our Scottish high schools, and it's been scaled up like all public health approaches should be. If it works, we scale it up. Um, and you know, and working in the, in the United States with Jackson, I've had the opportunities to work in university settings using MVP practices and sports teams. A few years ago, I was working with professional baseball teams on their spring training in Arizona. So the, the likes of the Cubs, the Dodgers, and the, the Cleveland Indians, and just talking about issues around you know initiations, domestic violence, and sexual violence, and more around you know creating culture. And I think a lot of people think bystander work is about teaching people to intervene. Yeah, that's a that's probably a very a short-term goal is to try and stop things happening. You know now. If, if you see something or you or you see or you be, or you become told of something how can you respond to that but for me we miss a trick if we don't go the next phase the the, the sort of next stage and that's to to use this space to try and um, change culture um so because we, we've done that with smoking with drink drink driving with alcohol consumption we've changed culture and you know we will only start to see further reductions in violence around the world when we start to tackle the culture and the culture is 
the, the, the sort of norms and attitudes that say violence is okay. And the, and the bystander approach is really good because it brings people into a conversation. It doesn't point fingers at them. And that's, that's important for men because I think just now the narrative around boys and men is quite negative. And there's a danger that we disengage um, boys and men. We, we, we blame them for their behavior. I'm not, I'm not excusing behavior, but we need to understand why people are behaving in certain ways. And I also think the bystander approach is a great way to influence people. You know, Michael talked about applying psychology. I, I do that every day. You know, how, do we, how do we create a narrative that is positive? How do we create a positive narrative that people want to follow? rather than a negative narrative that people want to fight back against. So the bystander approach, for me, it allows me to have a, a fantastic, positive conversation with young men, young women, boys, girls, anybody, because you know, the vast majority of people in our society are good people. And I think you know, we, 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 we tend to focus on the negative stories, the negative aspects of behavior, whereas we need to be focusing more on the positive. How can we influence, persuade people to, to come along with that. So I think, yeah, you know, working in, in, in Scotland and across the UK and, and in America, and I've done some work in Sweden with bystander work, it's just lovely to see the, the, the responses. And yeah, people leave with toolkits. You know, people leave with, a, with, a, with, an, with an array of tools that they can use to deal with something before something happens, when it's happening, but also after. You know, I train, train people to respond to victims of sexual violence or domestic violence to give them a, a sort of quick, quick narrative to sort of, in, in many ways, triage that person. How can we just, you know, the most important thing that any one of us can say to a victim of sexual violence or domestic violence is, it wasn't your fault. You know, let's get people saying that within the first few minutes of the conversation. Um, and that's a, that's a really important, powerful conversation to have. So, yeah, I think, Angie, do you want to come in here? I've spoken a lot there. <laughs> Yeah, great. Well, uh, you mentioned Jackson Katz and the work that you did with, with Jackson and it's really interesting. A Annabelle, who has just introduced herself a moment ago and I, we started off our work uh, three years ago together and uh, for me, I was very new to this sort of work. I really didn't have a background in, in understanding uh, prevention of violence uh, other than working in schools and, and, and from that very early, early phase. But what we used to do with Jackson Katz when we were introduced to Jackson was because Annabelle and I are women, we needed a male voice in our workshops uh, with schools. We felt that having a male voice in the room, as many people have said this before, that often a man can say things that a woman can't say and be heard. And so we actually brought Jackson's TED talk into our workshops. Uh, and so that was our first entree, if you like, into, into Jackson's work. And we were very, I think that the fact that he frame, framed it in, from a leadership perspective uh, and, and he did invite men and boys into the conversation, I think for us that was really powerful to have that. And then to learn the link between Jackson and the MVP and the mate, uh, what, what became mate here in Australia. You said before that you put a kilt um, on MVP when you took it to Scotland. And my understanding is that uh, Dr. Shannon Spriggs Murdoch, when she brought MVP here to Australia, worked with Griffiths University and people of um, great ilk like um, Sean and, and um, Anushka from Griffiths University, they, they Australianized the MVP and then became mate. I was and waiting not, um, to, to say what our version of putting a kilt on it was. I thought maybe. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I wasn't, I was thinking a little bit about that as Graham said that, you know, and what was interesting for me was I did, I couldn't find a term that would be respectful enough <laughs> to be completely honest with you. So I didn't go there. Um, yeah, <laughs> it was, it was going Vegemite. to, yeah, yeah, let's say that we spread it with Vegemite. That'll do. Yeah, yeah that, that's, that's, that's think, completely fair. I'm happy with that. Yeah, 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 yeah for sure. Um, yeah, on you go, sorry. Yeah, sorry. The other, I was going to say, when I started this work, when I we, we started uh, about three months before we we actually did the mate three day training, and what was interesting about that, I think it was on day two of that when I went home really angry that night, and I think it was the first time that I actually really got some of the stuff around this, and I think that's the power of of the mate. Uh, mate sessions MVP um, because what it does is it really helps you to recognize the issue and in fact the the issue is right there in your face and and then it, once it's exposed you to the issue um, which is a lot of the work that we now do we do a lot of that exposing around the issue and then to try and give people the tools and the knowledge to do something with that so that yeah. they actually yeah they will take action yeah I, th I think you're right Andrea it's you know 
that the bystander work it, it's like a, a great habit of making the invisible visible and yeah. i did i did the two-day training as well with, with jackson's team in two, 2010 and yeah i had i think everybody who goes on that training that that first that first night they leave the room and they come back thinking totally differently yeah. and our job i think my job now is to make the invisible visible yeah you know a lot of a lot of this stuff was invisible to me as a man for the, the vast part of my life you know it's, it's a shame that a man has to come in alongside no and let us rephrase that you know you no know, I, I, don't, I don't think men need to be in the space you know sorry i don't get this right i think women have been doing a great job talking about domestic violence and sexual violence for decades um but but what's been missing has been the male voice in there you know working alongside women yeah. and that's important it's not about us on the road it's about working alongside with the likes of you andrea but i think you know the, all the issues that we talk about in our bystander work the, these are these are personal issues yes. for people you know i've you know I, I i lost my dad to suicide in 2008 I, and i talk openly about about that i talk about my own experiences i talk about i've got two adult daughters and their experiences um in this in this world you know and their experience at the hands of some men and I think you know, it wasn't until I did this training that I, that I started to question my, my daughters about their experiences. And they just reinforced a lot of the things that Jackson's team were talking about. So I think, you know, that again, I go back to the, the point I made before. This work isn't just about teaching people to intervene. It's about making things visible. Mm. And, and, it's, and it's privilege. And more, and more often than not, we're, we're making the privilege. Privilege for me as a, ma a white male, heterosexual male that I have in society. Um, and when you when you see that it hits you in the face and you just go wow mm -hmm. you know and I think that, that that's important and let's not forget that you know Jackson talks a lot about General Morrison did General David Morrison in America and, and that, that 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 famous speech the standard you walk past or the standard you accept yeah. and you know, Jackson often says that 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 one line perfectly articulates um, by the, the bystander approach that Jackson created mm -hmm. you know this is about culture change it's not about you know, just you know, do this and do that. If you see something happening, yeah, we want you to do that, but we also want you to challenge your friends. I mean, if you if you if your your friends being inappropriate or saying something, we want you to say something about that. And if it's that, and that that's especially important in, in male male peer groups, because you know, men, whilst most men don't commit violence and abuse, a lot of us are silent when we when we hear it or when we see it. And that's what this program, that's what this approach is about. It's about allowing men to speak up. So. Um, I, w I want to get into the, the toolkit kind of stuff and get into some specifics, but can you two share some of the specifics that were, that, that gave you those, those negative or ang angry emotions or the, the shock, um, in the initial piece. So generally, um, you know, I can make some assumptions about <clears throat> what it was that was making you angry, but if you, if you could get specific, it might help some people that are watching this later. Um, and, and equally, when we get into the the, the uh, workshoppy kind of stuff and the, the tools that, that people can take, if we can get into some specifics, that'd be great. So maybe Andrea, what what did you where what was that anger um, after that first day or the first couple? Mm, yeah, I think I think it's important too then that I also acknowledge my privilege as as a white uh, heterosexual cisgender woman, uh, educated woman, and and in that I think what I think was interesting for me is that you know I all of a sudden had this realization that I've been on the planet for many years, decades, and I had I had been aware of what was going on at at some level. But I think when it was during the, the mate sessions, when they really put out there the sort of advertising and what the media does, I think it, for me, it was that because I then felt a sense of manipulation, I think, and to see the level of, of violence and the hidden messages in, in advertising in particular. And recently was at a workshop with a, a woman named Jane Gilmore, who, Matt, you may be familiar with her work. She does the fixed it work. So she looks at headlines in newspapers, predominantly in Australia, but all around the world. And headlines where they may be uh, victim, victim blaming, minimizing, excusing, uh, condoning violence against women, where the male perpetrator is often hidden in that message and she changes those messages. And one of the things that, that she talked about was she took a tram ride from her home in St Kilda uh, to the city a tram ride that school children take every day. 
And in that 20 minute tram ride, she counted 120 images that minimized, objectified women, sexualized children, minimized violence, excused, did all of that. And she said, these young children were swimming in that tram soup of that sort of stuff every day. And I think it was that sort of messaging that for me was like, oh, this is just not okay. This is no longer okay. And we have to do something about it. And, and I think Annabelle and I then were privileged in our role to be able to step into that space and, and maybe hope with that, along with all our colleagues to make a difference. Yeah. What about you, Graham? Similar to Andrea, in fact, it was, you know, yeah, white male, heterosexual male that, you know, I have, I'm top of the food chain if you look at society. And I think it was, it was looking at, you know, one thing we've tried to build into our program in Scotland is a lens of gender. You know, viol- you know, people often say, why, why focus on gender when you look at violence and why wouldn't you? You know, because if you look at violence in the world, we, you know, we have suicide problems, males three, four times more likely to die by suicide. Um, look what's happening with COVID-19. I'm, I've not got the exact figures, but men are most at risk of dying from this from this virus. Um, why is that? Um, and I think you know, looking at violence, you know, looking at some of the stuff Andrea talked about around the portrayal in media. You know, I've had a great opportunity over the last few years to work with the likes of Jackson, with Tony Porter, who's another you know, great American who speaks a lot about the man box. I work with Gene Kilborn. Um, who does a really good Killing Us Softly series of films, just looks at, at, at media portrayal and especially around around um, girls and women and how that can lead to violence. Um, you know, you know, and I think since then, so it's, I think it's, it's also, I started to reflect on <coughs> my own approaches to talking about violence and abuse prior to doing MVP um, bystander work. I've been very much of a lecture, you know, just thinking that I need to tell kids you know, this is how you behave and how you, this is what you should do and this is what you shouldn't do. And what I started to learn and, and since then is that, you know, my job isn't to point fingers at young people, it's to engage them, it's to make things, make the things that I see now so that they can see it, make the invisible visible. And I remember a few years ago going, doing a, a, a session around sexting, you know, this sort of sharing of images, n- naked images. And I was introduced by this head teacher in this Scottish school and she, she, was, she had about 100 kids in front of her and she was on, on the floor in the, in the assembly hall and she was shouting at the kids saying, you know, this is Chief Inspector Graham Golden of the Scottish Violence Reduction Unit and he's here today to talk to you lot about sexting and you better listen to him. And I, and I just, I got quite concerned about that, but I'd done that in the past. Um, but I went into the floor and I said, I said to the, the young people, raise your hands if you think sexting could be harmful. And every child raised their hands. So that, that lecture approach, that prohibition approach, it's needed in some bits, but we need, this is more about engagement rather than education. You know, I, I like to treat my audience as knowers. And, and, and what I mean by that is that most people know what's right and what's wrong. Most people know that you know about consent we've still got challenges around that i'm not saying we shouldn't talk about it um another good thing that in the bystander work does it allows you to hide the broccoli hide the broccoli is hide the distasteful conversation so you know you, you can you can you can you, you can you can have a really empowering conversation to young men um, as bystanders but young men will start to self-inspect their own behaviors and start to and you can you can make them feel uncomfortable without telling them to be uncomfortable. You, uh, ho- hopefully you understand that. So let's hide the broccoli. Broccoli is distasteful. As a young child, I didn't like broccoli um, because it was horrible. But I think you can hide a distasteful conversation and form self-inspection. But you can also empower victims and survivors. And that's another thing as well. I often get the drive-by thank you at the end of a session. You know, that person has clearly been affected by these issues either directly or indirectly. So I think... It's, you know, that, the, the, the first part was just the, the, the power of conversation and I, how I hadn't been using that post, you know, pre-2009, 2010. But now I, I go into a room with the, with the viewpoint that most people in this room know the answers to my questions already, but they don't know what their friends think. And my job is to get them talking. You know, so yeah. I, I, do a lot of, I do a lot of raising hands. You raise your hands if you think there's a problem here look around the room, look, you know, what do you notice? We all think the same. So we help people overcome the bystander effect, which Zimbardo talks about, you know, a way to overcome that is 
you know, if, if, if I know I'm going to be supported by my friends, I'm more likely to step up and do something. But if I don't know that, and that's, just, that's, the, that's quite relevant to the Harvey Weinstein stuff, is that most men in this world are disgusted with Harvey Weinstein, but they don't know what their friends think. So without that knowledge, they'll, they'll, they'll be silent. And I think what, what you can do with the bystander work is you can build a team where the vast majority of men are disgusted and they know that, and that, that's important. So, yeah, the, 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 the training just made, made the invisible visible, visible for, you know, for me. I think what you said about the, um, th those introductions that you get at schools or even at businesses too, where, where they are taught, that, that, that's happened to me for, for 12, 15 years. It's that for some reason, well, they, they're expecting their kids to not be well behaved yeah. or to, to not pay attention. And just last year I was told, you can't have you come in here for a 45 minute conversation with the kids because they they won't pay attention to you for more than 15 minutes and i was just in america in flint and it's just not a problem if you if you're engaging them in conversation and self-reflection through just point just explaining some concepts and 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 that sort of thing so i think there's a tough road there with um getting these sorts of conversations into the schools where it's not a lecture um because that's what that's what educators are are expecting. Andrew, did you have any reflection there on on Graham's thoughts? And I'd, I'd love to hear some of the, the practical stuff that both of you teach. Yeah, sure. I think, mate, and, and um, I, I don't know MVP, but I, I know because it's modelled on MVP that mate allows those facilitated discussions and it allows the people running the sessions actually, it, it gives you great confidence because the, the way it's actually uh, formulated, it, it's quite a process. You, you, you follow the process as a facilitator and you are uh, not, there's no lecture involved. There's no telling. It, it is drawing out from the people in the room, allowing those people to have those aha moments and, and to have them in, in a spa in space that's very safe um, and to, to, to position them as bystanders who can do something. As Graham said, that, that concept of a few people will commit violence, some of us will be victims, but all of us will be bystanders at some stage. And what we hope is that the majority of people will actually take action. Um, you've, yeah, you've, Graham. Um, Graham, you've, you've mentioned the word norms um, once and certainly re referred to it a few times. Can you just give us a, an introduction of what that idea means and how we can use it to change people's behavior and change the culture? Yeah, I think you know, there's an American psychologist, a guy called Robert Cialdini, C-I-A-L-D-I-N-I, -I -I, and he talks about the science of persuasion. And he, he, he coined a phrase a few years ago, it's called the big mistake. And the big mistake is when we, society, or in, in our role, we fail to use the power of social norms to influence behavior. And for example, um, an example of a big mistake would be, um, you know, a few years ago in a Scottish, a, a Scottish newspaper, it was one in 10 Scottish school kids have sent or received a sexually explicit picture. So that's the headline, one in 10 kids. Now, what's the other headline to that, to that story? <laughs> Nine out of 10 kids haven't. Hmm. And, what, what, and so that, that, that's an example of the big mistake. We're not using the social norms. And I'm seeing a lot of good social norm um, narrative around uh, in, in the UK just now around COVID-19 we're, we're, we're daily we're seeing charts of that, that which, are, which are telling us the vast majority of people in the UK are, are, are adhering to social distancing and not going out in the cars we're seeing we're seeing reductions in public transport usage we're seeing you know reductions in supermarket um, premises so that's that's communicating that that's the norm and, and, you know, the, the, the norm around alcohol, you know, we know that young people in, in around the world, well, I know in Scotland, are drinking less and they're having less sex. We know that from the, from the surveys that are going on, but we don't communicate that. We, we, we communicate the bad stuff. In London, we see, in London and England just now, we're seeing a big increase in knife carrying and knife crime, knife violence. But every, every day on, on social media, the police are posting pictures of big knives that they're recovering from young people. And if I'm a young person seeing this big knife, I'm thinking, I need a bigger knife. Mm -hmm. So you're actually reinforcing the pseudo norm that is out there. So we need to be focusing more on the good things that, that we see in society. And you know, a good, a good um, bit of work around when, we, when I do the MVP work, you know, MVP is delivered by young people to young people. So it's not delivered, you know, I train people to train young people. 
Um, I do my own bystander work in workplaces and, and whatnot when I train the staff. But when I do my bystander work in schools, I'm training young people to deliver the session. So I think that's another influencer as well, the social role modeling that's going that, that I, think, I think it's in psychology, they call it the social reverend. How do you create the group of people that people want to follow? So I think, you know, we, we, we fail, we, we, we miss a trick if we don't engage the healthy norms that we know exist in society. You know, most people know what's right, what's wrong. They know what's bullying, what's not bullying. They know what, you know, what's abuse, what's not abuse. Um, you know, we, I focus a lot, a lot on, on healthy relationships and people, talk about that um, as well. So I think, you know, um, Robert Sheldini's work is really important because, it hit, you know, I think a lot of the work that Andrea does that I do, we're trying to influence people. We're, we're trying to sort of re-steer the ship to, to, to actually the way that people are thinking. You know, and I work in prisons a lot and you'd think young men in prisons would be, yeah, bad, aggressive, violent. Yeah, well, they've, 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 they've committed acts, but when you speak to them individually, you, you, you can bring out some really good healthy norms, good dads, good partners, good, good lovers, good whatever. And then when they start to hear that, you know, what, what you promote, you permit. Mm. You know, I'm a, you know around, around male suicide, I think it's important that we don't, keep, we, we don't keep telling boys and men to talk more. You know, you, you, um, Matt, you and I, we need to open up and tell people it's okay. We need to create the conditions for Michael to talk. Now that's, that's important. So I think we need to be get better at using the actual real norms that we have in society. Yeah, I think that the, the, the very recent um, example of the of the messaging and the choices is happening around the world with COVID nineteen. I was just talking to my wife about um, how interesting it's been to see how uh, how people are speaking, the politicians, the health health people. And in Australia, we went from being lectured and yelled at for doing the wrong thing. And now there's a lot of reinforcement of the positive of the, we know that most people are doing this and that's great. Whereas before it was you bad people that aren't doing what we told you to do. Um, and it'd be, it'd be very interesting to see what the, the effects have been. Um, Annabelle and Michael, have you got any questions at this point? Um, Viola's just asked, um, do the programs work with peers? How do they? How are they related to peers? Andrea, do you want to talk? Yeah, so uh, there is, there is a lot of work being done around peers. Um, the idea with mate, it partly when you go and facilitate in a workplace, the idea is that you you may well facilitate with someone from the workplace that you are facilitating with a peer. So there is some work done at that level. So you're not having people come from outside the workplace or outside the setting um, that don't know the people in the room so that there are peers. In terms of the young people, it's a little bit different. Um, the work that we do in schools, we are very much working on peer, peer relationships, if you like, and peer influences and peers working with each other, um, particularly around the idea of uh, help seeking for self and others, the idea that when we help seek, we may be help seeking for our peers. And that's a really important component of this. So teaching people the skills to recognise that there's an issue and then know how to help seek for their peers um, is a really important part of this. And then modelling that for other children. Um, so there's a lot of work being done around that. Yeah, for sure. Cool. I didn't, uh, I didn't realize more people had joined the conversation. So that's why I'd only asked Michael and Annabelle for questions. But if you've got a question, throw it in the chat and we can, uh, we can certainly address it. Um, so let's jump into what the, what kind of things you are um, getting people to leave with what are, what are some of the strategies and, and tactics that mate or MVP are, are explicitly teaching people and whether that's kids or in the workplace yeah i think i think from, from my my perspective and i have you know i have lots of different aims and outcomes in my trainings but the four key aims are you know I, so people are leaving with knowledge so i want to raise an, i want to raise awareness of domestic abuse in scotland or sexual violence or bullying so that's the key ones to give them some more knowledge um, i want to challenge thinking so i want to challenge safely challenge Maybe, you know, people might be victim blaming, people might be adhering to myths around, you know, domestic violence, sexual violence. Um, so I want to sort of challenge that, say, you know, not, not tell people you're wrong, but, you know, help, you know, use the majority to maybe influence the minority. 
Um, I want to open dialogue is key. I don't, I don't know if you do these activities. We do a lot of what we call agree, disagree, unsure activities in our, in our work. It's similar. So, it's, you know, it may, yeah. it's, you know it's, it's the derivative of MVP. Yeah, and absolutely. It's, it's, that happens quite a lot. And, um, and that these agree, disagree, unsure statements are really good at just getting people to, to be leaders, to actually say how they think. So, and, and, you know, an example might be um, there's a serious problem of some men being abusive to women in Australia or in whatever that's going to be. And you agree, you stand there, disagree, you stand over there, unsure in the middle. And what that allows you to do is to raise awareness of the extent of the problem. You know, how many, what's the numbers, who's committing it, why are they committing it, what makes a problem serious? Is it, is it one incident or is it thousands of incidents? Um, so that, so that, that's an example. Another good example is if my friend is being abusive or being abused, it is not, it's not my business. So that is, that, that's like what I call a sort of leadership statement, which gets people thinking about their role if their peer, we talked about peers before, if, if their friend, work colleague is being the problem or being the victim. So, so we, we, we open dialogue. You know, I, you know there's, 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 there's some lecturing. Well, if I'm maybe giving people information, I am lecturing them. But in the main, the answers to all, a lot of these questions are already in the room. And the last, the last aim, um, is to inspire leadership with all this new knowledge, with all the reassurance from the group that it's not it's not just me that thinks there's a problem here. Everybody thinks there's a problem here. I leave them with a toolkit, and the toolkit is probably very similar to you, Andrea. You know, bystanders can intervene directly, which means they can go over and say stop it, or from a distance, whatever. They can do it indirectly. They can create distractions, disruptions. Um, but they also realise that if you just simply distract a situation, you haven't dealt with it. You might have stopped it, but you might it might happen the next day or the next week. Um, then we then talk about engaging allies, so you can engage people around you. Um, and I, I, you know, I, I try within the first five minutes of a session to let people know that they are, are in a room of allies. So very quickly, they feel comfortable because they start to realise that people are thinking the same as, as they are. Um, we can defer to other people. So you can speak to a teacher, you can speak to a police officer, you can speak to a, a door steward in a nightclub. You can tell somebody else who's not, you know, who is better equipped than you to deal with the situation. And the last option is to deal with it tomorrow. You might not be able to deal with it. You know, we don't want, I, I'm spending a lot of time just now on bystander safety. You know, I, you know, I, I, read, a, I read a good book called um, Legacy about the All Blacks. Sorry to bring that into an Australian conversation, but there you go. Um, and they talk a little, they've trained their, their, their players to, to try and stay in the moment. And what they mean, you know, they, they, they talk about code red and code blue. Code red is when you panic. And for a bystander, when you panic, you can run forward and become a victim. Or you can run away and do nothing. And I try and get people to stay in the code blue. The code blue is staying in the moment. And, this, and, this, and the staying in the moment for me is, is asking them, who is your primary responsibility to in any situation? And it's yourself. And even if for, even for, if for a second, you stop what you're doing, you see the problem, it's, there's, a, there's an emergency here, but you don't run for it. You, 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 you stay in the moment. And then you think to yourself, how do you use the toolkit? What, what tool can I use at this point? If I, can't, if I don't feel safe, you know, I, I might have to back off and just gather evidence or I might phone the police, but we don't want anybody doing anything that's going to get them in, 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 you know, sort of put them in harm's way. So people are leaving with good knowledge, with good reassurance from their peers that they're not alone, but they're leaving with a toolkit. And I, and I know the toolkit works. I'm hearing all the time of people who've used the toolkit, even speaking to a victim, you know, after a disclosure, they're doing something. And that can be, that can be, the, that can be very powerful if you say the right thing to a, to, to a victim. So that's, that's some of the things that I, I want to get across in my sessions. Great. So Annabelle asks, Graham, when you're yeah. training young people, are you training them to be MVP trainers or, or mostly to reflect on being a bystander? Um, when, I'm, when I work in schools, I, 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 will, I will train a group of teachers. Um, so high school teachers, partners, police officers, anybody who's working in the school. So the likes of Andrea or, and play Annabelle would be part of that team, that community team, because um, we're, we're trying to build a community in motion. That's a phrase I use a lot. How do we, how do we build the community, the schools, the community? And their role is then to, to, to work with the, the older young people in the school. So the, I don't know what your, so 16, 17 year old young people are then being trained by the, the school teams to deliver bystander scenarios to younger peers. 
is that, that it's that role modeling it can be boy to boy girl to girl whatever that 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 that, that, that uh, makeup is um that's that's the power but yeah so i suppose you know the the, the mvp program you'll find i think mvp strategies on online you'll get an access to the to 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 jackson's work um and um you'll you'll find out the model there but yeah but, the, but it's very powerful when you have a a young person speaking to a younger person you know because these young people have walked the walk they're at the cool face and what we found as well when it comes to deferring to other people as, as part of the bystander toolkit a young person is more likely to speak to a mentor than a teacher for example so we, we have a lot of disclosures to young people in our schools we train them in child protection I mean, they, they need to be child protection trained because they need to know that if a young person tells them they have been a victim of something they can't just keep it they need to they need to action it they'd be they'd probably the same in australia as well um so yeah ultimately within the the, the mvp program um i'm training people to train young people but when i'm doing my my other work in sports and prisons i'm working with adults and i'm training them to be um bystanders to, to be uh, active bystanders to be people who are who are equipped to deal with situations great and andrea annabelle's asked if the mate program has been expanded to be suitable for young people in australia is that where, where does that stand? Yeah, so my understanding in a conversation that I had with Anushka from Griffith University yesterday is that that's still a work in progress. They have adapted uh, MATE for, for other things, so for racism, for example. Um, but at this stage, there's, it's a work in progress around using MATE as such with young people. However, there are other people doing that sort of work. So I, I'll give a shout out to a couple of my colleagues uh, who work in schools, um, Jared Badup and Libby Hargraves, who have went up to the MATE conference last year, came away from that and have developed a program that they use with young leaders in their schools. So these are identified students by, by schools, um, multiple schools. They bring them together. They do some work. One of the important things that they do, though, and we do it too, is that we work on the culture of the staff in the school because it, unless the, the cult, there is a bystander culture amongst the staff, we can't expect a bystander culture from the young people in the school. So that's a really important piece of work. So um, we know that that's going on. So one of the things that Jared and Libby have done is they've taken the concept of the four types of bystander actions, if you like, from mates and MVP, and they've simplified it to now and later. There are things we can do now, and there are things that we can do later, which is a much easier concept for young people. Um, overlaid with that is something that we talk about in our work, particularly around dis taking disclosures from people or actively uh, seeking out disclosures if you believe that somebody may be at risk, is that concept of things that being, and Graham talked about this, sa my safety and safety for the other person so part of the work that we do in terms of knowledge raising is understanding that there are certain things that we might do as bystanders that actually may place the victim at greater risk. So that's very important when we're talking particularly about male intimate partner violence. So we need to understand the risks of how we go about actually taking action at that point. Um, when it comes to, to young people in our schools, we have a, a model that we work on, which is called the no-go tell change. And the change refers to working for change. So the, and the whole idea there between the, about the no-go tell is the idea that we should not be accepting any form of uh, harmful behaviour, unkind, unfair, unfriendly, disrespectful behaviour, and then knowing what to do with that. And then the idea of, of understanding. So one of the things we do is we look at social emotional learning and a whole lot of skills around that. So emotional literacy, being able to understand my own emotions, being able to read emotions in other people, being able to read an emotion to go, that's not okay, that person's not feeling safe right now. And then, as Graham talked about, that idea that, okay, I now see that there's a problem. I need to think about what I can do. What, what can I do that's safe for me? What can I do that's safe for them? You've talked about this in the past, Matt, that there is a real cost potentially uh, for people who may take action, particularly a social cost, an emotional cost. Um, and so we talk about that we openly with our young people because they, they, they know it. So that's a conversation that we have with them around that. Um, and, yeah, is that, do you want me to keep going or? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah. That, that idea, the other social emotional skills that we pick up with them is around problem solving. So that idea that when they see a problem, that understanding, I talked about this with Anushka the other day too, that sense that from the time our little people come into this world, we spend a lot of time telling them to mind their own business 
grasp that it's not their business, that they're dobbing, that they're making trouble for other people, that they're troublemakers. We do a lot of that. We have to unlearn all of that. We have to be actively unlearning that for them and unteaching un un that, which means that all of the adults in their world have to recognise help seeking as a skill. They have to model it, normalise it, um, accept it, reward it, acknowledge it, and, and really lift it, raise it up. Because unless we have a culture of help seeking being a normalised behaviour, and when our little people go and seek help, that an adult says to them, good on you, that's a great effort, good on you for seeking help to help someone else. That That's fantastic if we can have that. Instead of turning that young person away to the point where they go, well, why would I bother ever seeking help again? Why would I take action? Right. I think that, 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 that's an important point Point that uh, Andrew has made there. And it goes back to um, David Morrison's, the standard you walk past, the standard you accept. And I think, you know, we, we treat violence as a public health issue. Silence is the infection that keeps violence going. Yeah. Fact. You know, and we always talk about actions and consequences when, when it comes to intervention because we know that some people will still leave and still will still not respond. But I want them to realize that if you don't respond, it will have a consequence. Mm -hmm. And I think it's you know, you, you asked the point about, you know, is this being is the program being used in high schools? My my answer is why isn't it being used? Because you know, if you think about the, the context just now, you know, around the world, we have we have a real pornified culture. We have a sexually toxic environment going on. And whilst we, we, we often look at the, the outcomes of violence and abuse, all these issues are impacting on young people's learning. So a school needs to you know, get, get past the, the challenges because if we don't deal with the, the impact of unhealthy relationships in our schools, young people won't learn. That's a fact. No significant learning will take place without a significant relationship. And what, what the MATE program does and what MVP program is doing is it, it supports healthy relationships. And if you look at the, you know, the answer to every question, if, if, if the question is something is going wrong here, I always say to people, what are you doing about improving relationships? That's it. You know, the, 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 the shared agenda between teachers, between police officers is relationships. If we improve relationships in schools, learning goes up. Fact. We, you know, you, if you improve attendance, you improve attainment. If you improve relationships in society, violence comes down. So we need to try and you know look at you know, you know trust young people to do what they want to do. These are conversations that young boys want to have. I, I know that from my experience working with young men, they want to have these conversations. But we often skirt around these conversations. The, 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 these are distasteful ones, the broccoli. These are the distasteful ones for, for teachers to have or in pornography. Um, and you know, we don't need to create experts in young people. What we need to do is create a conversation. That's it. And I think we sometimes think we need the experts to come and speak about that subject or that subject. No, we, we, need, we need people who are trained to, to talk about what Andrea has talked about, to be aware of the consequences of intervention. But, but to create safe spaces to have important conversations because young people deserve that. You know, I want young people in Australia and in Scotland to go through school, to be successful, to leave school, to get a job, to be good mums, good dads, whatever that's going to be, good members of society. And that can only be good for, for the world that, 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 that we all live in. And, and the world's quite small just now because of what's going on. Mm. Um, so that... That's important. So the answer for, for schools is why, you know, why wouldn't you want to do this work? Yeah, so that's, that's my going to be my final um, request from the two of you then is if someone wants uh, this kind of training in their, their school or their workplace, two parts, how do they do that? How can they make that happen? And, and the second, especially if they're a parent that wants that in their school, um, but also, obviously, if you're an employee or um, or whatever, um, and then what does it look like? Is this um, a two day training always? Is it can you come in for an hour? Like, what are the options um, on how they can get you in, and then what that looks like? So maybe Andrea, I'll start with you. Yeah, sure. So, Mate itself, um, if, if uh, an organisation wanted to look at Mate, then they would either contact Griffith University or Gippsland Women's Health here in Victoria. 
Um, but there are a lot of women's health organisations that run bystander training specifically around prevention of men's violence against women, if that's what we're talking about specifically. So contacting any of your, your local women's health organisations uh, here in Victoria, Australia, Vic Health, but there'll be organisations like that right across the world, wherever MVP is or, or similar derivatives of that, whether it's MVP with a kilt or mate or whatever it is. Um, so contacting the organisations, I imagine, you know, just Google that sort of stuff. Um, if you're going to take that on, it can look at anything like uh, from a 90 minute session in a workplace um, co-facilitated up to, you know, three, two to three days of training. So it very much depends on what the workplace or, or organisation can commit to. That's adults that I'm talking about in that respect. There's a lot of other work that's available too, like the work that's being done in our schools. Um, there's a lot of people running bystander training of all sorts. Um, but for me, I, I would say if you're not going to use the sort of curriculum materials that we have already here in Victoria, then I'd be saying uh, knock on the door of Matt Langdon is what <laughs> I'd be saying. And I do tell schools that as well. Um, <laughs> You Absolutely. Do. Yeah, 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 for sure. But we, we, we have some good curriculum here that can that can help schools formulate a lot of this work as well and help them be ready to have these sort of conversations and to build the skills in our young people. If our young people don't have good social emotional skills, if the culture of a school is not one that's set up for bystander training, then I don't know that you can bring in someone for an hour. It doesn't matter who good how good the expert is, whether it's an hour, a, a week. I see schools investing thousands of dollars. I see workplaces spending thousands of dollars on this stuff they do it as a one-off because they've got to tick a box or something that's never going to work you've really got to actually have a, have someone in the school start with the coalition of the willing a, a group that says this is really important to us we want to change something here invest in it properly give it the time give, you know elevate it to the level of importance that it really deserves don't just do it for the sake of it you, you're not going to you certainly won't do any good you, you may potentially do some harm but yeah. um, you know do it properly and you're actually going to get a culture that supports bystander action empowers enables it and has that built up in the young people you work with as well right yeah. and annabelle's just sort of reinforced everything you've been saying about the how confidence can come from knowing that other people in the group are, are supportive of of what you're about to say or do so um yeah. that this kind of training helps helps with that so graham your your answer then how how can people get you in and what does it look like i think i think the, the, the first step is um Andrea talked about you know if, if this is if this is ticking a box then yeah it, it's it's short term you're you're basic basically putting a plaster on this this needs like for, for example in a workplace this needs to be layered training this you know does the chief executive need the same training as the people on the on the ground probably probably not but it's powerful when we're all together because we're, we're all coming together to, to deal with important issues so my advice for workspaces and, and leaders and workspaces is, is to take this stuff seriously because this stuff is affecting your workspace it's affecting your what what your staff safety not only issues in the workplace but say for example domestic violence outside the workplace and how that could impact mental health issues impacting on the workspace so you know, i'm a great believer in doing the knowledge learn about this stuff <coughs> i think base this training around your 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 culture this training is around um, building developing good culture so look at your values as an organization and then once you've looked at that and you've got the, that 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 I suppose that why you know why am I going to do this? Then you start to think about the training. You know, does you know I, I often deliver, you know, when, in a workspace I'll deliver half day trainings um, to to staff with follow up activities for, for, from time to time. I encourage leaders that every day they should be talking about the stuff. You know, and 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 you know, and actually role modeling respectful behaviors in the workspace um, in schools. You might, yeah, in Australia, get in touch with the likes of Andrea and, and yourself, Matt, to do work. Um, you know, anywhere else, you know, feel free to look at my website, um, grahamgoulden.com, which links to the work that I do. Um, and I can put you in touch with people in America to do to do MVP work. And I'd love to come to Australia and work with you, Andrea, at some point. Who knows? Please, um, Graham. <laughs> I'd be really good to to, 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 to to do that. But I think, you know, it's... I think for, 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 for leadership in schools, for leadership in workspaces, ask yourself the question, why do I, you know, why do I want to do this? You know, have, have the why. If, if the why is to tick the box, then yeah, you might look good for the, for the short term, but the long term is when you invest in this for the long term. 
you invest in this and this this becomes part of the bread so sorry, um, become, becomes part of the golden thread that runs through your organization it's, mm. it's linked to your values it's workplace justice as i heard yesterday someone mm. talked this is this is you know uh, you know, this is about you looking at your space that you're working in, living in, learning in, playing sport in, and thinking, right, how can I improve that? Um, and you do that by creating a positive culture. Um, so I think, yeah, it's, and but also trust your staff, trust your school, young people in schools, trust your staff. They know a lot already. And your job is to, what Annabelle talked about, is about, you know, bringing the, the group norm and the individual norm aligning so that that i know that everybody in this space here thinks the same as me mm. because then i've got allies i can get, i've got people i can speak to so that 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 takes a bit more than a, a 90 minute or a three hour or a half day workshop that's ongoing mm. and my, my job is to plant the seeds and then hope and, and the good organizations are the ones that get me back to nurture the seed and to develop it yeah yeah mm. yeah that's well put I, i've often thought about it as the creating the spark that that they, that they can then um, flame up. Yeah. Mm. Well, thank you two very much for all of that. Um, I'm, I'm hoping to put you in the same room at some point soon with a, a hero round table in person. Um, Good. Thanks for everyone who, who came. Um, Michael, I would love to talk to you yeah. next week about your work. Um, and, and I can tell you about the hero round table, but uh, if you if you're interested, I'd love to get on a call and um, email me at at Hero Roundtable. That'd be that'd be great. So again, yeah, thanks uh, everyone. Yeah, Matt, my, Michael, Michael might be interested too in Professor Paul Mazarol, who's at uh, was at Griffiths University, but is now at New Brunswick University in Canada. He may be interested in that that work as well. Great. Uh, what is his name, Andrea? Um, uh, Professor Paul Mazarol. What's his work? Uh, violence prevention research. Um, okay. So very heavily involved with MVP and or mate here in Australia, yeah. Um, but yeah, but but a very well credentialed man around and still doing research and has just moved back to Canada. Okay, great, thank you. Um, Matt, can I say something? Yeah, yeah. I was just going to say thank you, AP, and thanks, Graham, and thanks, Matt, for the discussion. It's really great. It's great to do it online, and also I really liked it because with the COVID sort of social isolation thing happening I've really struggled trying to balance that with trying to be a bystander because when I walk to the shops people look at me with scared eyes especially elderly people who have all their masks and their gloves on and I feel like what's happening now really inverts or subverts the whole notion of being a bystander or a hero because it's you know you the best thing to do is to stay at home and it's horrible when you actually have to go out and people look fearful at you because you want to be someone who doesn't provoke that in others. So it's really, I've been thinking a lot about it because it's not yeah. nice being in yeah. society where you can't enact your bystander principles because, you know, I saw someone at the post, outside the post office, which had closed down today and she was an old lady with a mask and her gloves on and she wanted to pay a bill, but she didn't want us to come close and she sort of looked at me and said oh my gosh the post office is closed and I can't pay the bill but I would have liked to have offered to help her but mm. I couldn't because I knew she'd be scared of that help and it was really mm. it's really difficult yeah we we talked about that a little bit earlier today in one of the conversations I can't remember which one but that yeah it's mm. it, it 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 is tough and, and and it's tough if you see something negative happening um mm. there's that fear and just fear of of intervening because of that um physical uh closeness and i watching the news tonight there was a, a car accident somewhere and i just thought how how terrible that usually is for those mm. first responders and how much more uh frightening and and mm. yeah uh risky that is now you know i Car accidents are, uh, you know, I don't want to call them ordinary, but they're, they're, they're happening all the time and this is making them making them quite different. So, yeah. I think, Matt, what, what something we, we can possibly do which may help Annabelle is that idea of acknowledging the, poten the potential of what that other person may be feeling. Mm. So to actually call it out loud and say, I know you might be frightened right now and you may actually be frightened yeah. of me in this situation. That is perfectly okay and I understand that. I, yeah. I wonder if it's actually, we, we probably need to name that in ourselves mm. and in others. 
I, I, I agree, and Andrew. I think it's. I think we sometimes just expect people to know what to do. Yeah. And the reality is, we that's not always the case. So I think you know that's when 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 we offer the toolkit, we we go into the toolkit. We mm. I, I really you know I think um, Zimbardo calls it the heroic imagination. Mm. How do we give people the tools to sorry give people the narrative of what to say? So to the old lady in the and in the post office, you know, you're you can you can maintain your distance, and mm-hmm. you can say you know, what Andrew is saying. You know, this is a, a difficult time. Mm-hmm. Here's some options for you. Here's some things you could be thinking about doing. Mm-hmm. But unless we create that narrative, people are not going to know what to do and what to say because they're always thinking, "Well, if I say something, am I going to make it worse?" Mm-hmm. Whereas the reality is, you know, people love connection. You know, this is a you know, human beings thrive on connection. And this is a time in, in, in history where connection has been taken away from us unless mm. we claim it back. Mm. And we have to adapt. I think we have to adapt to this. And this social distancing is going to be with us for the next foreseeable future. Right. This isn't something that's going to stop next week or in six weeks, 10 weeks time. It's something we're going to have to get on with until um, a vaccine is produced for, for this virus. So mm. I think we're going to have to learn to adapt to speak to people in the supermarket from a distance that's mm. that's important and i think that that will only come with with the government with your politicians saying things and giving the narrative out but us as well you know we are all you know everybody in this space just now is doing their bit we're staying at home you know mm. we are being we, we are being we, we're, we're, we're not standing by we're doing something and it's important mm-hmm. to realize that that you know it's all you know violence prevention is, is lots of small things coming together the same mm-hmm. thing is the same for this this virus. It's the small things we're all doing. You know, mm-hmm. we should all be clapping each other in, in six months' time when we're all, because we've all done our bit. Prevention mm-hmm. starts and, in the community. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think you're right. You're right. This discussion's made me sort of reflect again on the toolkit, that there is a toolkit, mm-hmm. and you always have to sort of delve into it and make sure you're aware of what your tools are. Mm. Yeah, I think that, you know, that it's very uh, important to re-up your certification in CPR and first aid. And I yeah. think this is, um, this falls into that same kind of category. Yeah. I th- I but, the other, th- other thing I reckon, Matt, at the moment is that we, we only almost need to be preemptive bystanders. Um, yeah. So, you know, rather than waiting for something to happen, and then take action that we can there are many many things that we can do to to preempt that things may happen and get in beforehand and i don't know if it is preemptive but that's yeah that's the way yeah, I'm, I'm thinking of that's sort of the key of of zimbardo's heroic imagination is imagining these different situations that you might be able to intervene in and mm. imagining what your intervention is before it even happens so mm. Uh, I'm going to leave it at that. And yeah, yeah. Next thank you, thank you, Graham. <laughs> thank well, you, everyone. Yeah, thanks you know, for organising it, Matt. Everybody, and uh, we'll hook up again. Yeah, we will. Yeah. Cheers. We'll good on you. Good. Enjoy right. your broccoli. <laughs> <laughs> Take care. Yeah. Ciao. Bye.